Training camp is officially underway at the VMAC as the Seahawks have launched the 2023 season. We're going to be breaking down key observations from day one, including standout days from two of Seattle's young electric receivers. All coming up here on our Wednesday edition of Locked On Seahawks. You are Locked On Seahawks, your daily Seattle Seahawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team Every day. Greetings, 12. This is Corbin Smith, host of the Locked On Seahawks podcast, your daily Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Glad to be joined here for our Wednesday episode by my co host in crime, Rob Rang. Our listeners that are watching on YouTube, you'll notice we're both in hotels. It's that time of year. It's travel season with football officially underway. We're going to dive into all the key storylines coming out of day one of Seahawks training camp, both on and off the field. There certainly were plenty of stories off the field before Seattle even went out there and started practicing this afternoon, including a holdout potentially for Seattle's top draft pick. There's a lot of storylines we're going to be diving into jam-packed day one of training camp episode coming your way here on Locked on Seahawks. This episode is brought your way by eBay Motors. A championship team is about each player being a perfect fit. Same with your vehicle. So for the parts that fit, head to eBay Motors and look for the green check. Stay in the game with eBay Guaranteed Fit. eBayMotors.com. Let's ride. eBay Guaranteed Fit, only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Now for your lead story here. On our Wednesday edition of Locked on Seahawks, we've been waiting for months, but the anticipation finally yielded the start of a new football season today. The Seahawks opening training camp at the VMAC. A lot of exciting things going on on the field for the Seahawks, including some explosive plays, and they didn't come from your usual suspects. DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett had pretty quiet first days of training camp, but there were several big plays today, and they came courtesy of first-round pick Jackson Smith and Jigba, and a player that I believe many fans maybe have been a little bit too quick to move on from, being D. Eskridge, both of these guys coming through with dynamic plays today. And that's certainly an exciting development for this offense. It's already got Metcalf, Lockett, a lot of other weapons. If you've got Smith and Jigba and Eskridge both clicking on all cylinders, suddenly this offense becomes extremely difficult to stop. Exactly. That's what we talked about, Corbin, that we were so excited and, and confident that Juno Smith is going to be able to duplicate or perhaps even exceed his unbelievable production a year ago in large part because of Seattle's greater depth at the wide receiver position. So to see Jackson Smith and Jigba be able to come in and kind of literally hit the ground running, uh, you know, in, in his first NFL training camp was great news. And then I, I love that you mentioned D. Eskridge. I mean, he was the player that I, you know, argued early a couple of, uh, of shows ago that I really thought that he could be kind of that wild card. He could be that breakout player for the Seahawks because we are talking about an explosive athlete and a guy that I think just fits in beautifully with Shane Waldron's offense as far as being that that that, that guy that can be effective on screens, the guy that can be effective down the, the seam, the guy that can be a, a deep threat, the guy that can be a, uh, you know, a return man as well. And so that's, again, one of the things I really like about out, the, the two new receivers, and again, Eskridge obviously is far from new. That's why there's so many Seahawks fans out there who are frustrated. But he obviously hasn't been able to show what he can do to this point. And when you do see an elite athlete, uh, you know, really start to kind of pop, it, it, it's pretty obvious. And, and that was the feeling that I was getting from Eskridge, uh, Jackson Smith, and Jibba, and, and Matt Landers from Arkansas as well. So I think that we got to talk about all these young receivers because you're right. I mean, it, it was a, I, I thought, a, from where I was able to see a, a solid practice from Tyler Lockett. You know, we, we expect greatness from Tyler Lockett. DK Metcalf had a couple of drops. To me, the big story of the day really was the youth and the playmaking ability of Seattle's, uh, these newcomers at the wide receiver position. Yeah, and as you mentioned, the, the drops, that's something that fans are going to pay close attention to because we know that has been an issue on and off for DK Metcalf. But let's look at the positives coming out of today. And specifically, I want to talk about how these explosive plays happened because that maybe is the thing that shocked me the most. Anybody that watches this Seahawks team and really the entire Pete Carroll era, as successful as they've been, 
one thing they have not been able to do consistently at even a mediocre level. That's just an honest assessment. That's running screens. They have not been able to run screens at all to save their lives. Last year, they were dead last in the NFL in success rate on screen plays at around 14%. That is atrocious. You just can't ha have that with a successful NFL offense. It's amazing they finished in the top 10 in scoring considering that. But Jackson Smith and Jigba got the fireworks started today with – a slot bubble screen and there was a little bit of a hesitation step off the snap to it too and so it was something i haven't necessarily seen the seahawks run and to be honest with you rob i've been to dozens of training camp practices and i maybe can count on one hand the number of successful screens that i've seen ran out there i mean this is a team last year that i think would have struggled to run screens against air that's how bad that it was last season that's just a, a brutal honest assessment but to be able to see even a day that Pete Carroll said, hey, our defenders are running by guys, they're not tackling, it doesn't matter. They executed three screens during the practice. I can't believe I'm saying this. In one practice, they had three successful screens. You had the touchdown with Jackson Smith and Jigba on the slot bubble screen, and then D. Eskridge, a typical bubble screen, he ends up breaking free. The crowd goes nuts. He scores on that one. And they ran a tight end tunnel screen to Colby Parkinson that got 20-plus yards as well. So I was excited to see the variety. Pete Carroll said it's always been in our playbook. It probably has been, but we haven't seen it utilized on the field. And when it has been used, we haven't seen any success. So I know it's just one practice day in late July. It might not be a precursor at all for success in the regular season, but this was the best I've seen the Seahawks run screens in a practice by a long shot in my time covering the Seahawks. And I think a lot of it has to do with the type of players we're talking about here in Eskridge and Jackson Smith and Jigba, who are both players, even though Smith and Jigba is not quite as explosive overall as what Eskridge is, both these guys have great acceleration and great burst after the catch, and they can break tackles. So utilize those skill sets in the screen game they've got the pieces in place to be effective now they just got to put it together they've got the receivers to make this work they, they really do and, and yeah that, that's you know always my focus is going to be on the player personnel the the actual strengths and weaknesses of the players themselves but i, I love that you mentioned from a you know just from the x's and o's standpoint seattle's struggles in the screen game i mean it's that's gone back for for years i don't know the seahawks have run a successful screen game since the chuck knox era you know i mean it's just <laughs> been a long long time that seattle has been one of the better screen teams and i understood that when you had a shorter quarterback that that was always going to be a challenge w one of the things i was particularly excited about when i saw that say that the, the screen to jackson smith and jig before a moment you mentioned the kind of hesitation move from from jsn again that's the savviness that we've talked about before it's a route runner that he has demonstrated i just love the quick release the accuracy of geno smith's throw uh the, the ball would have hit jsn in the face if he hadn't caught the ball and it was out quick and again that is one of the things i think is kind of unique about juno smith that he does have a quick release he demonstrated of course great accuracy uh i think with with smith and jigba he doesn't have the explosive burst that d eskridge has and that's what makes them kind of like you know peanut butter and jelly a nice combination because they are kind of opposites in a way in that regard and then finally again the personnel i've always thought especially this last year when seattle had the two rookie tackles Every defense that's going to face Seattle is going to try to get pressure on the quarterback, and they know that they have two rookie tackles out there. So the screen game would make sense, invite that pressure, drop it over the top, show the, yep. the touch, the accuracy that Geno Smith has always demonstrated. You should be able to rock and roll. And again, because Seattle has such a, a much more, a much greater variety at the receiver position this year, I do expect the screen game to be a little bit more of Seattle's offense in 2023. They've also got the running backs. And as I mentioned, Parkinson had a nice tight end yep. tunnel screen game today. Zach Charbonnet, Kenny McIntosh, even Ken Walker III, DJ Dallas, all four of those guys can make plays in the passing game and in the screen game. And so they have the pieces in place to be successful, but they've had that before and it still hasn't worked out. It hasn't mattered who's throwing the ball. It doesn't matter who's calling plays. 
I've reached a point where I've started to wonder if it's a curse, but maybe this is the team that can break that curse. And again, don't want to overreact. It was just one practice, but seeing those couple of really long touchdowns on screen plays, even if there's no tackling, it was really exciting to see. And also being able to see Eskridge score a second touchdown on a deep crosser that drew lock through on a line to him contested catch reels it in. A lot of reason to be excited about his play right now being healthy. And, of course, Jackson Smith and Jig with the first-round pick. The hype, living up to it here early. Of course, very early here in training camp. Coming up next, we're going to talk about some of the off-field business that was taken care of with the Seahawks and maybe stuff that wasn't taken care of, in particular with Devin Witherspoon. A lot of details with the roster off the field. We're going to be diving into their pup list designations, a potential holdout, and much more. That's coming up next year on our Wednesday edition of Locked On Seahawks. This episode is brought your way by BetterHelp. Here's a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Life can be full of twists and turns and throw a few wrenches at you when you least expect it. So it's important to show yourself through it all and put a focus on your mental health. BetterHelp Online Therapy will assess your needs and can match you with your own licensed professional therapist in less than 48 hours. Therapy worked wonders for me on multiple occasions, but don't just take my word for it. Having someone in your corner to guide you when you're struggling to navigate obstacles can be invaluable. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's professional therapy done securely online and available to people worldwide with therapy can take a few tries to find the right fit for you better help is a great way to invest in yourself and better help has a special offer for our listeners get 10 percent off your first month at betterhelp.com slash locked on that's 10 percent off your first month of online therapy at betterhelp.com slash locked on you're listening to the wednesday edition of locked on seahawks the first day of training camp for the 2023 season i'm your host corbin smith glad to be joined as always by my co-host in crime rob rank and a special thanks to all the 12s out there we greatly appreciate you making locked on seahawks your first lesson five days a week whether you're listening in nearby redmond or you're all the way across the country listening in patriots territory in boston massachusetts we greatly appreciate it for our everydayers out there tomorrow we'll have day two of training camp plenty more observations coming your way and we'll be taking a look at which players maybe have boosted their stock in the first couple days of training camp as well. Going to be a loaded episode. Hope you'll be listening in. It was a busy day for the Seahawks on the field their first day of training camp practice starting the 2023 season. The doldrums of the offseason officially being put to an end. Football has returned, but that also means there's plenty of business off the field. And unfortunately, there were some positive and negative news bits for the Seahawks today in terms of off-field news and let's start with the most concerning one although Pete Carroll doesn't seem like he's overly concerned about it Devin Witherspoon not in attendance for the first day of training camp practice because he remains the only incoming draft pick that is unsigned he and the Seahawks he and his representative in the Seahawks appear to be at odds on this rookie contract and a lot of it boiling down to how the signing bonus is paid out when it's paid out that's really all they have to argue about rob because these are slotted draft picks now they have been the last couple cbas it's not like you can negotiate the value of your contract it's really about offset language with the signing bonus and me personally from the seahawks perspective and from witherspoon's perspective i i don't really get it for either side like it's a slotted contract just knock this out get it done and yet it sounds like the player and his representatives aren't necessarily going to budge on that, especially with Derek Hall getting that historic second round signing bonus contract. Sounds like Witherspoon wants a piece of that pie early too. Yeah. I don't think that it's, it's that surprising to be completely honest with you, considering the, the way that the first four picks that were drafted and then the contracts that they signed, as you said, Corbin, this is the only rookie there. Uh, there were 259 of them that were drafted. And this is the only player in all of the NFL that has not signed his rookie contract. And it, as you mentioned, it, it basically is already set. Uh, you know, this is going to be a four year deal. It's going to be worth 31.8 million dollars. That signing bonus that is basically what it sounds like is kind of the, the source of the consternation. That signing bonus is 20 million, uh, $171,000. It's exactly those are, you know, it, it's already been slated. The, 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 
dispute, it sounds like, is when exactly is Witherspoon going to get that money. Now, the, the issue here is, again, this is the top five selection. Three of the, of the four picks that preceded Devin Witherspoon were quarterbacks. And all three of those quarterbacks, Bryce Young, C.J. Stroud, Anthony Richardson, went forth to the Colts. All three of those guys got completely 100% guaranteed deals, and they got their signing bonuses basically when they signed. And then the only other defensive player to go on the top five picks, Will Anderson for the Cardinals at number three, he got 75%, I believe, of, of his uh, signing bonus immediately. Um, and the rest of it will come this year as well there's not a lot of teams out there who want to give the guaranteed dollars to rookies for obvious reasons. And so that's going to be the debate. I understand it from the young man's perspective. You know, you want to get the money now, especially if others are getting it. At the same time, I also think that you have to understand that as a defensive player, you're not going to get the same type of a deal that a quarterback is going to get. That's just the reality. Running backs all across the NFL are kind of bemoaning that positional reality right now as well. So I, I understand the perspective from both. The only way that Devin Witherspoon is going to get any of that money, of course, is when he signs the actual bottom line. The only way the Seahawks are going to have any success with Devin Witherspoon is when he signs the bottom line. So I, I'm kind of more in the Pete Carroll realm and in, in I don't think this is anything to be too concerned about unless Devin Witherspoon and his representatives really want to kind of just plant their flag in the sand and, and really make a big deal about this. But that's not the indication that I've been getting. I think that this is going to be wrapped up in the next couple of days, and you're going to see number 21 on the field for the Seahawks here shortly. Yeah, there's a little bit of irony to this. If you're wanting to get your signing bonus, more of it paid quickly, the longer that you wait to sign your contract, the longer you're going to have to wait exactly. to get your money. But I get it. It's business. I understand it. And this is not something the Seahawks have had to worry about because they haven't had top five picks. It's a different realm when you're talking about the elite players in draft classes. These guys want big signing bonuses paid up early. They want guaranteed money. And that even goes for cornerbacks. But like you said, the quarterback position, that's where teams are going to invest that kind of guaranteed money. Even Will Anderson didn't get fully guaranteed money from the Houston Texans. So it's going to be difficult. you got to find that middle ground. But it doesn't sound like to this point they've been able to do that. I think that this deal does get done potentially even tomorrow because I think Devin Witherspoon wants to be on the field. I think the Seahawks want him out there. They'll find a way to get this done. As far as other news – this is much more expected. We weren't necessarily expecting Witherspoon to miss a practice and not have his contract signed, especially after they opened up that cap space. But what we were anticipating, Rob, is that the Seahawks were going to have several notable veterans that were going to start training camp on the pup list. In fact, they've got six of them, Jamal Adams and Jordan Brooks. We've known all along there was a very good chance that those two were not going to be active to start training camp, even though both of them from everything that's been told to me from people in the building, what Pete Carroll has said, what he said today, it sounds like they have a pretty good feel where these guys are at. They're confident, maybe not fully confident in these guys playing in week one, but there is still optimism there, but they're not going to rush them back onto the field. The same for defensive tackle Brian Monet, even Tariq Woolen, who had knee surgery earlier in the offseason. Everybody expected him to be ready for training camp. He is on the pup list as well. So maybe he'd be ready to come back, but they're not going to force the issue. And it makes sense. You've still got well over a month until your first regular season game. You need these guys ready for week one. So let them ease back in and they can be activated at any time. Some of these guys will start practicing the next few days. Some of them might take several weeks like a Jamal Adams or Jordan Brooks. Really the only surprise was Noah Fant, unless you were not paying attention last year. Noah Fant had a knee issue at the end of the season. He was on the injury report, Rob. And yeah. apparently that knee issue was still lingering a little bit. So he had some type of a cleanup procedure done. He's already running sprints. So he's another one that sounds like he's pretty close to being back on the field. But he was the sixth guy that was on the pup list for the Seahawks. A lot of notable players. But not, really, other than Brian Monet, there really wasn't any – bleak sounding reports on these guys and it does seem like the Seahawks like where everybody's trending right now at least in regard to the regular season yeah exactly as you said there were the six players there um Ostafaulu the the big nose tackle what was the other player I'm not sure that you mentioned him there so you have two nose tackles there Brian Monet and Ostafaulu who um were are on that pup list right now and so I, one of the things to kind of 
bounce off of this news here is, is I thought it was interesting that Pete Carroll kind of unprompted mentioned Jaron Reed as a nose tackle uh, for the CX and just how critical that was going to be. So I, I mentioned Jay Reed here just because for one, I think he's a good player. I think we've talked about how important that he is. Um, but for number, for number two, again, with the, the six players that are placed on the pup, with, with two of those players being at that position, then you obviously, that, that's a position that I said just in yesterday's show that was my still my biggest concern. Well, I am less concerned if you're going to move Jaron Reed there. It, initially, when Seattle signed him, the talk was always that he was going to be playing one of those two defensive end roles. Um, I love him inside. I think he has the size, the physicality to be very successful there. Um, you know, at the same time, I, I still am very excited about, say, Cameron Young, obviously the rookie as well. Uh, one other thing here, as far as the news that I wanted to mention, because Devin Witherspoon obviously is not signed, Seattle has another uh, another roster spot open te technically at, at this point. So they did bring in another player. They brought in Chris Steele, who Seahawks fans might remember from a year ago and had spent some time in, in Seattle. And this is a talented corner now. This is a guy who was a five-star recruit that, that signed with Florida um, out of high school, wound up transferring. There was some um, some off-field issues that I don't know that actually Chris Steele had any, uh, you know, in any negative way. It was all kind of positive from what I understood from Steele's situation, but he was in a, in a in a difficult situation in Florida. Decided to kind of transfer closer back home. Played at St. John's and Bosco and uh, in California. Went to USC and was very productive there for a couple of years. And you know now he's on on Seattle's roster again. And again, I think this kind of comes back to one of the things that we just touched upon in our recent shows: the cornerback depth. So. Again, as concerning as some of these this news might be that Witherspoon is holding out, that Tariq, that Reek Wool, excuse me, um, is uh, in starting on the pup list. Again, I really like Seattle's depth uh, at corner. The Chris Steele signing today, I think, helps that. And again, the news that um, that big Jaron Reed is going to be logging time inside at that nose tackle position. That is significant news in a in a minor way as well. And I say minor just because I don't know that a lot of people nationally are going to be paying much attention to that. But again, with my biggest concern for this club was, are they going to be able to hold up in the middle? With Jaron Reed, his size, his strength, his, his experience, I really think that that does solidify the interior for the Seahawks talking about the depth at corner at safety at linebacker it really is a good segue for continuing to dive into everything that happened today at the VMAC training camp day number one we're going to we're going to continue excuse me our observations from Wednesday's first practice that'll come up next year on our Wednesday edition of Locked on Seahawks I'm your host Corbin Smith glad to be joined as always by my coast in crime Rob Rang and a special thanks to each and every one of the 12 that's listening in to today's episode and makes Locked on Seahawks your first listen five days a week we greatly appreciate it for every day we're going to have all the details from day two of training camp Coming up tomorrow on our Thursday show should be another jam-packed episode. You won't want to miss it as we get started officially with the 2023 season. Looking at day number one, we already talked about how good of a day D. Eskridge and Jackson Smith and Jigba had. To me, those were the two real big stars today coming out of day one with long touchdowns. Eskridge had two of them on the day. But there were other players that also had some really fine first days to start off training camp. And I'm going to piggyback off what you were just talking about with kind of a positive slice here when we're looking at the pup list or at least a bright side to it. And that being that several of these positions, the Seahawks did what they needed to do this offseason to add depth. And in particular, I want to talk about the linebacker position. And, and I've talked about it a few times. I think that there's certainly – some uncertainty there at that spot. Bobby Wagner's 33, but you could see that presence on the field today. It didn't look like number 54 was gone for a single day, even though he played for the Rams last year. It's just the response that the fans gave him, that was expected. But seeing him take Devin Bush under his wing, you could see him numerous times in the field, standing right next to Devin Bush, and he was teaching him some stuff during their individual drills giving him some advice. He was back to barking at the offense during their team drills. It really did feel like Bobby Wagner never left. Number 54 had always been here, and there is a ripple effect to that. And also the leadership by example. And I know some of our listeners are going to say, Rob, that, well, this doesn't seem like a big deal. These are NFL players. They should all hustle. But if you've been to a training camp, you know that a lot of times your 11, 12-year veterans 
they're not going to be running to the sideline every single time there's a run out wide. They're not going to be going full speed to the sideline all the time, especially in these first couple practices, because they quite frankly don't feel like they need to. But that doesn't set a good example for the young players today. Bobby Wagner several times. You could see him shooting from his middle linebacker spot and going full bore, getting to the sideline in pursuit. And as Pete Carroll mentioned, you know, that is the type of leadership that this guy has always brought to the table that Quite frankly, I feel like the Seahawks, that might have been where they missed him the most last year in the middle, just the way that he carries himself, the overall package as a leader, and seeing him and Devin Bush out there and the way that the young guy is just acting like a sponge, taking in everything he can for number 54. That was something that showed up, and I think Vi Jones as well. He definitely looks 10 pounds bigger than last year, and he made several impressive plays today. So I thought the linebacker group, even without Jordan Brooks, it was better than I expected today, to be honest. And just seeing Devin Bush learning from Bobby Wagner, I think that's a pretty big deal. Oh, I 100% agree with you in that. And, and maybe it's just because I'm getting older and I'm a little bit more sentimental now. But, you know, to, to hear the, the crowd, you know, we talked about this before, when the way that the crowd shifted in the in the, the, the season opener a year ago and enchanting Gino, uh, you know, and, and the way that, uh, you know, the Seahawks season obviously culminated, um, you know, what was, uh, you know, what was spectacular. And to me, it's it got the same kind of chills, uh, listening to the crowd just get excited for Bobby Wagner's return. Uh, that was that was definitely a, a cool moment. Um, you know, again, I'm going to kind of go back rather than than focusing on Bobby Wagner because, again, I think that we we all know who he is. We we know the what type of player he is, and I think that we're getting a reminder of the type of person and leader that he is. Um, and, and but rather than focus just on on Wagner, who I feel like is. You know, it's just about as kind of consistent. It's kind of like Tyler Lockett before. It's almost like boring to talk about greatness because they're great so consistently. And that's what's amazing about them. But also, I, I want to talk about a couple other players who kind of just from a physical standpoint stood out. You mentioned that Vi Jones looked like he was, you know, legitimate 10 pounds heavier. I thought that Daryl Taylor looked like he had gained some weight in his lower half. And that's important. Because if you're going to be playing run support, you've got to be able to hold up at the point of attack. And so yeah. I just thought that, again, from the belt down, I thought that he looked like he had gained some weight in his thighs and in his butt. I mean, that, that's that's the power. And, and so that was, uh, I, I think, it's definitely something that I, I noticed. I, I was impressed by Julian Love. Uh, you know, got an interception here uh, in his very first practice here. And obviously, he's going to, we're, we're hoping that we're going to be seeing some three safety looks here with Jamal Adams. Seahawks fans know very well that, it, you know, Jamal Adams' strengths and his weaknesses. He is not necessarily known for his ball skills. So for Julian Love to make that first impression as well by picking off a pass, I think it is important. Um, so again, those are a couple of the, the guys that really jumped out at me. And finally, one of my, my favorite ones, you and I were talking about this right before we started recording the show Corbin so you might be able to you know give a little bit more detail having been there in person but the power of Derek Hall on a particular bull rush against Stone Forsyth to me is again what we talked about that he is going to be able to provide a little bit more size physicality and a little bit a point a to point b type of pass rush rather than the big loops that we see from some of Seattle's other pass rushers we saw that on display today as well so it, like you said I, I thought that there were is not that Bobby, not obviously Bobby Wagner wasn't his debut in Seattle, but it was obviously a return. And that was three important kind of quote unquote debuts that we saw from new Seahawk defenders that to me was in a way kind of stole some of the show from some of the, the playmakers the Seahawks had on offense uh, to start off today's training camp. Those of you listening that love to read my articles, I'm back to my daily observation pieces. I always write them within half an hour after practice ends and press conferences, and I kicked out my first one today. And I'm glad you mentioned the newcomers because Bobby Wagner's not a newcomer. Obviously, he played 10 seasons in Seattle, and yet he is technically a newcomer because he played for the Rams last year. But Julian Love getting an interception, right place at the right time off of a dropped pass by DK Metcalf. That was a perfect throw by Geno Smith, and he just wasn't able to haul it in. It ricochets, and Julian Love picks it off. But Derek Hall, I will say this. You've got to take what happens in the trenches with a huge grain of salt this time of year sure. because they're not in pads. They aren't able to fully play the way that we're going to see these guys when it's actual football. And at the same time, watching him take Stone Forsyth who is a pretty darn big guy. I mean, we're talking 6'8", well over 315 pounds. I mean, this is a big dude. And 
he took him and it was like he was pushing a five pound blocking sled just drove him straight back into geno smith's lap and you could hear some ooze in the crowd from the way that happened and then there were a couple other plays where you can't tackle here so it wouldn't show up in stats but there were a couple times where he set an edge he was in a position to make a tackle in the backfield and then he just kind of tapped the guy because he couldn't tackle him so I was encouraged by what I saw from Derek Hall. He was somebody that jumped out to me several times today, just the way that he was handling his assignments, the gap stuff. Those are the things you look for right now when they're not able to play with full physicality. And I thought Boye Mafe looked pretty good too. I will say this, that edge rushing group, Uchenna Nuosu, Daryl Taylor with that more strengthened physique in the lower body, and Derek Hall, Boye Mafe, Tyree Smith, Joshua Oniogo, who had a really nice rush today off the edge too. That is going to be as competitive of a group when you're talking about battling for snaps as maybe there is on this entire roster, because at least right now, the cornerback group, you know, Trey Brown and Mike Jackson, they're going to get the bulk of the snaps because Witherspoon and Woolen aren't playing. But at that edge position, all six guys just mentioned were out there today, all going full out balls to the wall. These guys were you can just tell they're chomping the bit and they understand hey if i take a day off somebody else is taking reps away from me and so i think that really speaks to that always compete mindset that pete carroll has always preached you see it with the edge rushing group you can see it with the offensive line i was over there watching again you can only get so much watching these guys right now but just seeing the way that those guys were getting after it because you know you've got direct competition especially the center and right guard spots you can sense that with just the urgency that the guys are playing with. And so that's something that was really exciting for me, especially with the edge rushing group, getting to see guys like Derek Hall really be able to get after it, get after the quarterback, even when you're talking about non-football related practices, really. It's not real football. There's still things that you can look for. The effort is always going to be there with Derek Hall. So he is certainly somebody that jumped out to me today when we're looking at the standouts from the day and Vi Jones would be a close second with a couple pass breakups. He had a pretty good day. He just looks more like a middle linebacker now with the extra muscle that he's added. I, I was joking with a few of the reporters last year. This isn't a slight, but last year was almost like Vi Jones was the skeleton of KJ Wright. That, that's really what it looked like. He had the same Jersey number on really skinny though, long arms. And, and this year he's still lean. I don't know that he's ever going to be anything but lean. He's tall, kind of lanky, but he's clearly added some muscle. So those are things that really jumped out to me today, just getting that first impression, being able to look at this football team. And those are some of the guys that really jumped out that I thought had really strong days. No, I, I, again, I, I agree with you. And uh, I thought that's kind of, in, in, a, in a lot of ways, it's kind of the perfect segue to one of the, the last points I wanted to make about day one and train camp is we, we talked about the leadership that Bobby Wagner um, offers, uh, you know, and, and Pete Carroll, and then they always compete mantra and that you just have to have veterans that are going to be able to demonstrate that leadership because you know, the young players are going to come in and, and they're going to be chomping at the bit. They're going to be so excited. They want to make that, that strong impression. Um, and, and so, to me, that was one of the things that I was noticing, not just body types, not just things like that, but you know, who was lining up in, in with the number ones and things like that. And as I mentioned before, my biggest areas of concern for the Seahawks on both the defense and offense are the interior of the lines. So I was very much paying attention. That's why I mentioned before about Jaron Reed kind of getting the start, so to speak, at the nose tackle position over the rookie Cameron Young. And it was Evan Brown, the veteran, who got the start, so to speak, over the rookie that we've talked about so much, Olo Olo and Timmy. So to me, those are kind of interesting things. Uh, Phil Haynes, of course, at right guard are, are the three critical positions along the offensive and defensive lines that we're going to be talking about all throughout training camp uh, it wasn't a surprise to see the veterans get the quote-unquote starting nod but it still was uh notable and, and something i think that, that bears watching as we move forward yeah there's no question about it we're going to be looking in detail at all of those competitions as training camp unfolds we get into the preseason games and we expected to see the veterans be the ones that are going to get those first looks even last year jay curhan was the starting right tackle to open yep. training camp before Abraham Lucas ended up winning that job and taking it from him midway through camp, became the starter in the preseason games. 
maybe some of these competitions will end up playing out similarly, but I will just say this. You can see the depth. It feels like, and, it, and it's weird because we saw this team, they only had 50-something rostered players going into the draft, but it does feel like this is a team that is top to bottom more competitive right now overall than what they were last year on this roster, particularly on the defensive side of the football. And you know that that's got Pete Carroll excited, especially when they can get some of these veterans like Jamal Adams and Jordan Brooks and Brian Monet, get some of those players back on the field. It's only going to make things better. And we'll get a better scope of where things stand when the pads come on here in about a week and a half. But for now, you're going to take what we can observe right now in the, the limited practices, the non-contact practices, and certainly speed killed today. You got to see some newcomers on defense make an impact as well. So it was an exciting day at the VMAC and fans getting to cheer on their team starting a new season. As always, you can follow me on Twitter, Corbin Smith NFL. You can follow Rob at Rob Rang. Subscribe and follow Locked on Seahawks on YouTube and wherever you listen to podcasts to make sure you don't miss a single episode coming up tomorrow. We'll be back with some more training camp observations coming out of day two at the VMAC to get your insight directly from the facility. Make sure that you are listening in to another jam packed episode with football season officially underway. Thanks for listening in and enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Go Hawks.